the Lord's Supper earlier, two ordinances. Jesus clearly left his church, believers' baptism by immersion, and for then for all those who have been, uh, have made a profession of faith in Jesus Christ and followed him in believers' baptism by um, immersion and are walking in unity with uh, the local body or even those who are who are looking for seeking a local body he says come to the table i'm going to invite our men to come at this time as we prepare to share together the lord's supper Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus Christ, we come to you confessing that we come to this world fallen people. We know that Christ lifted on the cross has by grace through faith lifted us from our fallenness, and yet we confess we still stumble. We, we want to be strong. We, we know that you summoned us to this fellowship meal, this communion with you to challenge us to rekindle faith and strengthen it. And so it's in that heart's desire that we receive it. We're grateful today that we can welcome to the table J.R. and Ashley. And we pray that that reality would repeat it, be repeated over and over in this place. So, in the name of him who said, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest, we come. In Jesus' name, amen. On the night that he was betrayed, there he was in the upper room. Celebrating Passover, so they thought. It was Passover season, so they expected the Passover meal. And something very radically different took place. He did not take the loaf, which they, the loaf of unleavened bread, which God had taught them uh, when they were in bondage in Egypt to, to fix this unleavened bread called bread made in a hurry. He took that loaf that night not to remind them that they were to be ready to escape Egypt upon God's command, but he took that loaf and focused on himself. Paul would say in Corinthians, Christ, our Passover has been sacrificed. He said, this bread is my body, broken for you. Take and eat of it in remembrance of me. I was shattered by the fall Broken and forgotten Feeling lost and all alone Summoned by the King Into the Master's courts Lifted by the Savior Cradled in His arms I was carried to the table Where I don't belong, carried to the table, swept away by his love, and I don't see my brokenness anymore when I'm seated at the table of the Lord. Carried to the table The 
table of the Lord. We, as we said before, do this a little differently. They had one loaf. And no doubt he took it and broke it and passed it around and said, take it. One loaf. One body. These little wafers are broken for us, but we're one body if we take them together. And they remind us that our Savior was willing to be broken for us, that we might be made whole. And so he said that night, and I believe if he were here today, he would say to us, this is my body broken for you. Take it and eat it in remembrance of me. Scripture says in the same way he took the cup. And I've said to you many times through the years here, I believe that when he spoke, as he spoke about the loaf, that he had their attention about the cup. They were waiting to hear, what's he going to say about this? Because he had departed way off the Passover script. And he talked about the cup representing his blood. They knew the cup in terms of, of covenant commitment. The cup of Passover to the final cup was to remind them that God had committed himself to them. Even the Ten Commandments begins that way. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the house of bondage, who brought you out of Egypt. Covenant. But he shifted. He brought the covenant expression full face to himself. What was anticipated in Passover was that God would send one who would be pure, spotless, blameless, like a Passover lamb, who would die. And there before them that night, though I don't think they understood it at the time, there before them that night was the Passover lamb. The one whom John had said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So he challenged them that night as they drank the cup to think of him. Covenant sealed in my blood. Let us do that today as we take the cup. of fear wondering why he called my name am I good enough to share this cup this world has left me lame and even in my weakness the Savior called my name in his holy presence I am healed and unashamed as I'm carried to the table He said, take this cup. Again, it was one cup. They would drink from the pass around. 
powerful symbol that there was one Savior shedding his blood one time for them. It was about to happen. They took the cup. He said, as you drink it, do so in remembrance of me. And then he told them, he said, as often as you do this, he didn't tell them how often to do it. He said, as often as you do this, you are together showing forth the Lord's death. He's still alive when he says this, the Lord's death until he comes. And here we are, 2,000 years on this side of the resurrection, seeing clearly what he did. Committed in this set to show forth the Lord's death. I have no doubt that there are people here who are not yet followers of Christ. And my prayer would be that as you've seen these powerful symbols today in baptism, in the Lord's Supper, that you would ask yourself, why? Why have I not been baptized? Why have I not confessed faith in Christ? When you see the bread and the cup pass before you, why can I not participate in that? What, what holds me back? It's a sin of unbelief. And, and my challenge would be to trust Jesus Christ, believe in Him, repent of the sin of ignoring Him, and come to trust Him as your Lord and your Savior. My prayer would be before we gather like this next month, that God would save you, that you welcome to the waters of baptism, and invite you to join us at the table. Let's bow in prayer. Thank you, Lord, for this meal. It's a covenant meal. Help us now to renew our covenant with one another as surely as we have renewed our covenant with you by taking the bread and the fruit of the vine. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together. We're going to read our church covenant in unison. If you're a member here, you've committed to this. I like to read this every time. Check myself and say, am I, am I honoring my commitment here? Let's read this in unison together. Since by divine grace we have been brought to repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and to commit ourselves to him, and upon our profession of faith, having been baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, relying upon his gracious aid, we do now solemnly and joyfully renew our covenant with each other. We will work and pray for the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. We will walk together in brotherly love, exercise an affectionate care and watchfulness over each other, and faithfully admonish and entreat one another as occasion may require. We will not forsake the assembling of ourselves together, nor neglect to pray for ourselves and others. We will purpose to accomplish the Great Commission by making disciple-makers who follow Christ love God, love others, and serve the world. We will rejoice at each other's happiness and with tenderness and sympathy endeavor to bear each other's burdens and sorrows. We will seek to live for God's glory, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, remembering we have been buried with Christ in baptism and raised to walk in a new and holy life. We will work together to advance a faithful evangelical ministry in this church as we sustain its worship, ordinances, doctrines, and discipline. We will contribute cheerfully and regularly to the support of the ministry, the expenses of the church, the relief of the poor, and the spread of the gospel through all nations. We will, when we move from this place, as soon as possible, unite with another church where we can carry out the spirit of this covenant and the principles of God's word. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. I want to to read some language, I think it was put up on the screens for you about the time we were having our baptism. And I want to read this to you. Listen to this for further reflection. 
When we have baptism, we baptize him in the name of the Father because you belong to his family and you're going to love one another as brothers and sisters. In the name of the Son, because Jesus is now your King and you're to serve him as he served you. In the name of the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit has, not, has now not only given you new life through regeneration, but is going to empower you to be his missionary to the world. Now you're commissioned to the Great Commission to make disciples who make disciples. Baptism is the commission from the Spirit to do the work of Jesus of making disciples. In church, when we do this, you should see yourself as a releasing culture. Why do we read this? Why do we, there was a poll released recently. Bar, a Barna poll. Barna was pretty accurate in his polling. That over 51% of professing evangelical Christians say they have never heard of the Great Commission. Never heard. These are people that attend church. Never heard of the Great Commission. We must keep this before us and understand that everything we do, everything we do, is about making and sending disciples. I want you to turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2. We're only going to introduce this today. We're about to plow into a section. Chapter 11, verse 2 through verse 16, that is one of the most challenging in this entire letter. Because I want to submit to you, Paul takes a historical reality and makes application into cultural context. And you're going to see further what I mean by that, which makes this a very challenging passage to study together. Yet, by God's grace, for the next few weeks, we're going to dive into this. It teaches us about biblical uh, manhood and biblical, and, and particularly in this p passage, in the context of life in the church, but, but the applications ripple throughout society. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2 through 11 verse 16. Stand with me if you would, if you found that in your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, we're going to have it on the screen for you so that you can see this. Remember, we told you last, a couple weeks ago, that the chapter break between the end of chapter 10 and the beginning of chapter 1 is artificial. Uh, imitate me or follow me as I imitate Christ. He, he says in chapter 11, verse 1, he's finished with the force and the emphasis, the implications of Christian liberty. And now he wants to make sure, as he's done all through that study, we went from 8 through 10, to make sure that liberty does not become license, that there, we have a God who's a God of order. And this is so pertinent to us because we live in a culture right now that is so completely out of order. Follow along as I read. Now I commend you because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions even as I deliver them to you. But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ. The head of a wife is her husband and the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. But every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head since it is the same as if her head were shaven. For if a wife will not cover her head, then she should cut her hair short. But since it is disgraceful for a wife to cut off her hair or shave her head, let her cover her head. For a man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God. But woman is the glory of man. For man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. That is why a wife ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor man of woman. For as a woman was made from man, so man is now born of woman. And all things are from God. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a wife to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not nature itself teach you that if a man wears long hair, it is a disgrace for him? But if a woman has long hair, it is her glory? 
for her hair is given to her for a covering. If anyone is inclined to be contentious, we have no such practice, nor do the churches of God. Difficult. But even though it's difficult, what have we just read? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. And my prayer is that we'll be able to unpack this. God will help us by the Holy Spirit to see the historical and therefore an eternal basis for Paul's teaching and yet fit it into cultural context that where we live uh, may not connect with us today. We need, to, we need to make that connection. We need help to make that connection. Thank you. Please be seated. Well, in the previous study of, of, of 1 Corinthians that we've undertaken thus far, Paul has dealt with matters of personal morality and behavior. He now comes to give instructions or directions concerning the worship of the church as a body. What does it look like when the church gathers? He's concerned that the women of Corinth, remember we've said to you that if you wanted to insult a woman in, in that part of the world, in Paul's day, you would call her a Corinthian woman. That was a very, very serious insult to her. He's concerned that the women of Corinth, these who've been saved by grace through faith, not express their new freedom in Christ by flouting cherished customs that reflect God's order. He opens the section with the words of praise. And we're not gonna we're not gonna exegete this today. I want to give you just a kind of a snapshot of the principle so we can start chewing on this and then come back next week, God willing, and start plowing through this. He opens with praise, and in doing so, my, my Greek professor, Dr. Curtis Baum, said, and then introduces one of his most difficult passages from the standpoint of modern application. And he does this with the Corinthians likely being aware of what he had written to the Galatian Christians in that in the province of Galatia, in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. If you've dealt with anybody in the cultural wars, asserting that God has order in society, order uh, between the sexes, order in the home, somebody's probably shown Galatians 3, 28 to you, which says there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And Paul is writing that to the churches in Galatia to let them know that we don't have castes. We don't have people who are of a higher status than others. And that's something you guys to really hang on to when you look at this language. It is surmised that some of the Corinthian women may have inquired whether or not the conventional, conventional social custom of a veil for the woman should be maintained in the light of their new spiritual freedom in Christ. In other words, do those cultural mores apply? In giving his answer, Paul is not speaking of how women should dress in public, but how they should dress in the practice of corporate worship. The covering for the head in this passage should be understood, according to J.K. Barrett, as a head covering concealing the hair and upper part of the body, not as a covering for the face, not a, not a full-flung veil. And then when you go read about New Testament times, the diversity of this is all over the map. For example, Jewish men, then as now, prayed with their heads covered. Perhaps misunderstanding. Of course, they wouldn't pay heed to what Paul was saying here anyway. Greek men and women prayed with their heads uncovered. And Roman men appear to have prayed with their heads covered. So Paul, moving through this cultural milieu of where he was traveling. Remember, he was traveling among Jews. He was traveling among among Greeks, non, non-Jews, those influenced by Greek culture, and he was traveling among those influenced by Roman culture. He wants to carve out a Christian identity and practice in this. He appeals to the created order. We're going to see that as we study through this passage. And as you heard us read, 
He cites creation. When he does that, we know he's not addressing something, quote, culturally or strictly culturally. Creation is not cultural. Creation is historical. And when you get into this passage, I hope you're going to understand better why there are those, why there has been an intentional assault for some time now upon the historicity of the creation account. If the story in Genesis is about how God made man and woman, how God created everything, if that is undermined, if that is done away, then the door is wide open to carve your own way. But if you embrace as historical that in the beginning he made them male and female, then all of this nonsense that is sweeping over our culture about all these different gender identity expressions, that just flows right down the sewer where it belongs. So I know there's an assault on creation. There has been since shortly after the beginning of time. And so the tension we're going to find is that even though man and woman are one in Christ, Galatians 3.28 makes that plain, that there is no superior-inferior arrangement. God has given role, relationships, and responsibilities to each to bring order out of chaos. And if you're culturally aware, if you're paying attention at all, you realize that when you abandon that, the only thing left is utter chaos. There are states in the United States now that are offering alternative gender identities to male and female. You can choose something else. And to avoid offending someone, you don't say he or she, you say Z. I I don't even want it is so absurd. It it's hard to embrace. And the number of gender identities are growing. It's up to 15, 20, 25, 30 now. Thankfully, the Bible gives us the better way. And so I want to recognize that Paul begins this as a good example. I commend you. He, he begins with a commendation because what he's going to be saying after that is going to ruffle feathers. So he begins by commending them. One of, some of you will be familiar with some of the material we've gone through on, the, uh, on, on, on parenthood, the, the one-minute praising, uh, the one-minute clear instructions and expectation, the one-minute praising, the one-minute reprimand. Paul uses this introduction to commend them. They are commendable people in some ways. I commend you because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions even as I have delivered them. He says, I'm so grateful that you remember me and you pray for me. And that you, that you have a commitment to continue the things I laid down. Traditions here used by Paul are not the same as the traditions that Jesus chastised the scribes and Pharisees for. Paul says, I gave you an order, I gave you a path to follow, and I commend you that you're, that you're serious about them. And then he lays down a principle that I want us to see today. And this is as far as we're going to get. It's just a snapshot of the principle. Verse 3. I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ. The head of a wife is her husband. And the head of Christ is God. This is what's been called the principle of subordination of the woman to the man. Look at what he says here. The head of every man is Christ. Every man. The vilest, most rebellious, most recalcitrant, God-hating man has a head, an authority, a source. And that's one of the challenges, by the way, let me just say parenthetically, 
when you try to, to exegete this passage. The question is, does this term head speak of source, where they, where they derive their being from? Or does it speak of authority? And uh, my Greek professor, Dr. Curtis Vaughn, said this is one of those occasions where I don't think you can successfully choose an either or because both apply and are true. The head of every man is Christ. No man would even breathe without the permission of the blessed Son of God by whom, Paul says in Colossians, the world holds together. If Jesus Christ were to determine I'm going to relinquish my authority and headship, this planet would spin out of control and crash before we could know it. Paul says in Colossians, he holds the world together. Every man, whether he recognizes it or not, whether he embraces it or not, is under the headship of Christ. And let me say again parenthetically, part of the problems we deal with in our culture today, a big part of them, is the failure of men to be men. There could be no feminist movement, radical feminism, if men had followed the example of Jesus and the teaching of Paul to, cre to treat women as God intended. That's why men's fraternity is so helpful in recovering that. So every man, if you're male, if you know someone who's male and is confused about being male, someone who's male and wanders into the women's restroom at Target, doesn't matter, Christ is that person's head. And he will give an account to his head one day. The head of the wife is the husband. The head of Christ is God. Let's look at this picture. I want you to see this. This is beautiful. Christ is over every man. So he's over husbands. Husbands are the head of the wife. Now we're not going to get there today, but... His argument for this is that when God created Adam, he caused a sleep to fall over him and he took Ish, Isha, out of man. She is woe man, coming out of man. So she sourced, woman is, in man. But he's going to do a balancing act. Because ever since then, Every man who's ever walked the planet has come from woman. But then he says this, and the head of Christ is God. Now this is, this is how we know that he is not speaking superior and inferior. When Jesus Christ came to this earth, he subordinated himself willingly under God, his Father. He would say things, we've looked at this before in John's Gospel particularly, I, I can say nothing except to be given to me by the Father to say. I do nothing except what the Father tells me to do. I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me. Jesus was keenly aware that while on this earth, he was subordinate to the Father. But he was never inferior to the Father. I and the Father are one. The doctrine of the Trinity taught in Scripture speaks that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are co-equal, co-essential, co-eternal. And while we recognize that we worship one God in three persons, it is wrong to ever think that one person of the Trinity is inferior to another person of the Trinity. And the fact that Paul lays it out this way lets us know that whatever he's going to be talking about, about husband and wife, about man and woman, he is not talking about superiority and inferiority. And it's very interesting, even the, even the order in which he did this. The head of every man is Christ. No man is independent. of himself. And everything a man says and does to his wife 
He will answer for to his head God. I'll tell you about a friend of mine. Came to see me years ago, <laughs> decades ago now. Pounding on my desk. My wife will not submit to me. I said, well, uh, if that's what submitting to you looks like, I don't blame her. It's totally off the mark. We need to know that. Men, we need to know that. We need to raise sons who will realize that, that we will give account to God one day for the way we have treated women in general, our wives in particular. Women, God loves you enough that he places you under the loving, why we read Ephesians 5 today, the loving, Christ-like leadership of a man. You say, well, preacher, my husband didn't get in that memo. Well, 1 Peter 3 says, pray for him, win him without a word, pray that God will teach him. I pray specifically, Jesus the Bible says he's yours. Please do something with him. Please make him like you. And so that we don't misunderstand the dynamic here, that nobody is, is being placed in a position of inferiority, the last thing he says is, and the head of Christ is God. And so you would have to, a woman who says, well, I, most people just teach that women are inferior. Then you would have to embrace that we teach that Christ is inferior. And it's just not there. It's not honest, the text. I'm going to close with this. The fifth commandment. I've told you through the years, I would love for you to memorize the Ten Commandments. I get frustrated when I see these people picketing for the Ten Commandments and statues of the Ten Commandments. And, and yet if you ask them, what are the Ten Commandments, they couldn't tell you. There's, then it's, then it's, just, it's just a, a symbol. It's, I want you to memorize the Ten Commandments. I want, you to, I want you to delve into the catechism on the Ten Commandments. Because the fifth commandment, honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land which the Lord your God has given you, is the bridge commandment that also touches every relationship we encounter while we live on this earth. It speaks of some who are in authority to those who are under their authority. It speaks to those who are under authority and how they relate to those who are in authority. It speaks to equals, those who share. And by the way, that is the beauty of what we learn about how to relate to one another in, in family and in church and in society under a government. It's all there, packed into the, the fifth commandment. And so that's all Paul is doing here is what I'm saying. He's simply drawing out the Christian implications of relationships ordained by God. It's going to be challenging to go through it. Some of you are going to be rubbed. I understand. That's okay. If you belong to Jesus Christ, a good little gospel sandpaper is, is good for all of us. It, 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 gets, it quickens us. It strengthens us. It, it knocks off the stuff that needs to be knocked off. So you pray for me and you pray for yourself as we delve into this in the next few weeks that God will help us. Remember now, it's historically anchored in creation. He's applying it to a culture that doesn't look like our culture today. I will tell you as we go through this, the Muslims in their head-to-toe burqas have nothing to teach us on this. Nothing. Nothing. So what we've got to come up with is how do we then in the 21st century take this historically anchored truth and apply it to how we live life so that we can say we recognize God is the head of Christ. As a man, I recognize that, that Christ is my head. And as a woman, I recognize that my husband is my head. And then train our daughters to do well. Train our sons to do well. What's this got to do with the gospel? Everything. Because the one who lived and died and rose again as portrayed in, in both of these ordinances today 
is the Lord of his church. Paul will say at the end of this passage, if you're going to be contentious with me about this, I need you to know there's not a church I've started that believes differently. We cannot afford to believe differently either. Let's pray.